Yeah, we're in the. Uh, so, 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 is that better? Yeah. Or do you want white? It's a. Uh, it's a laptop. mentors, uh, undergraduates, graduates, doctoral students, um, conducting research, of course, on applied linguistics and multilingualism. Uh, before uh, joining Georgetown uh, in 2012, she was on the faculty at uh, Georgia State University, Northern Arizona University, and the University of Hawaii at Manila, where she had uh, done her MA and PhD. Professor Ortega has uh, research on the ways in which people learn new languages, uh, particularly in higher education settings. Uh, she is well known for her work, uh, especially uh, her award-winning meta-analysis of second language instruction published in Language Learning, uh, best-selling graduate-level textbook, Understanding Second Language Acquisition, uh, which I used when I was on the faculty at USC, um, which was just translated in, into Mandarin a few years ago. And um, since 2010, has been championing a bilingual and social justice turn in her field of SLA. Right? Her latest book, co-edited with her colleague, Anita Hauer, uh, entitled The Cambridge uh, Handbook of Bilingualism, has just been published. Okay? Um, Professor Ortega was born, raised, and educated in southern Spain, uh, worked as a teacher of Spanish in Greece for almost 10 years and has now lived in the U.S. for over 25 years. And so her lived experiences have afforded her um, uh, perspectives, her language uh, resources in Spanish, uh, German, modern Greek, and English have, of course, contributed to her research. And this has shaped her not only um, professional identities as an educator and researcher, but again, as an advocate for social justice in terms of committing to investigating what it means to be uh, a bilingual or a multilingual later in life, okay, uh, and across elite and marginalized contexts for language learning. She's the co-recipient of many awards, including the Penzler and Tiesel Research Awards in 2001, uh, was a doctoral Mellon Fellow, a postdoctoral Spencer National Academy of Education Fellow, a Senior Research Fellow at the Freiburg Institute of Advanced Studies, and uh, recently a Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Graduate Center of City University of New York's Advanced Research Collaborative. Um, she was formerly the Journal Editor of Language Learning and served currently as the Associate General Editor on the Board of Directors of the University of Michigan's Language Learning Research Club. Um, she was just elected uh, second vice president of the American Association for Applied Linguistics, an office that will lead her to organizing the annual conference in Pittsburgh in 2022, and then being president in 2023. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Professor Ortega. Thank you, Professor Ortega. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Can you hear me? Okay, if you can't, in the back of the room, uh, wave and then I'll notch it up. Um, let me start by thanking uh, Christian, who 
invited me to come long ago, and I'm so happy to be here. This campus is amazing. You guys are very, very lucky to be in this PhD program, and I've already met with several of the students, Nancy, Julia, and other students, and I can see there is a sense of community that is uh, pretty unique and pretty amazing. And Panayota has been very welcoming, and Evi, where is Evi? She just left. She left. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> She's been helping with the, all the paperwork and the logistics. And I'm happy to share the PowerPoint with the references if anyone wants it, um, so that don't don't agonize over taking notes. <laughs> Let me set up the stage first. Let me ask everyone in the room, raise your hand if you think you are bilingual, if you think yourself um, as a bilingual. All right, everyone's hand should be up. And <laughs> that was really what I wanted to start with. Um, the definition of who's bilingual, who's multilingual, um, has taken a life of its own in the fields that deal with bilingualism and multilingualism and language learning. And so terms like monolingual, bilingual, multilingual are really contested, are very elastic. Lots of people understand them in different ways. Um, and we will return to this idea later. But for me, and for many scholars, um, being multilingual or bilingual is not necessarily someone who is from birth exposed to two languages. It's also not someone who is native-like or who can pass for a native. And it's not even perfectly, equally, proficiently speaking two languages or as many languages as you have. It's just functionally being able to use more than one language for one's own purposes in life. So if I ask again, do you see yourself as a bilingual? Yes, no. Yes. Everyone, everyone should raise their hand under this definition. This is the definition that I have in mind for the entire talk, okay? Um, in my field of second language acquisition, there have been a lot of turns. In the 80s, we had the cognitive turn. In the 90s, we had the social turn and Right now, we're having a very slow, but I think very short, multilingual turn happening in the field. And um, I think I started talking about it, not that I was the first person in SLA talking about it, but I personally started talking about it in 2010 at a plenary at AAAL, and then I wrote an article on that journey um, in 2013. And I started constantly writing about it. You know, learning a second language should be viewed as a road to bilingualism or multilingualism. And when I think back of my textbook that I wrote, which I'm trying to finish the revised edition for, um, I think that some, somehow I was already in 2006 to 8 when I was writing it. Um, I was already envisioning a second language acquisition that was kind of a, 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 a the story of the field told in a different way. Right? And I'm very proud of the book that just came out uh, this year, the handbook, the Cambridge Handbook of Bilingualism, because we just said bilingualism, and my co-author and I, uh, Annick de Howard, we just thought, no, we're going to talk about bilingualism, and it's going to be along the entire uh, lifespan, right? So it's going to be people who study their bilingualism and multilingualism from birth, very early in childhood, a little bit later in childhood, as adolescents, as adults, and even as much, much older than just adults, right? And we're going to call it bilingualism. Um, but since, especially since 2016, I think, I've been more and more thinking, well, is it enough? <coughs> we had the cognitive turn, then the social turn, then the multilingual turn is you know, sort of happening. Are we happy now in the field of SLA? Is it enough? And I thought, oh, it seems to me now clearly since 2016 that we, what we actually also need is a social justice, justice turn in the field. And it's because we live in very uncertain times. I think no one would doubt that. And this is true even in our affluent and traditionally democratic societies. Things are falling apart. And if we think of the UNESCO goals for 2030, 
they want to end poverty, promote peace, share wealth, protect the planet. I think if there are about 190 something members of UNESCO committed to these goals officially. And yet, what's on the rise in the world? Well, conflict and war, non-solidarity, anti-diversity, anti-immigration, anti-welfare state, populism, widening poverty gaps, very serious in our own country, um, and an intensification of racial and religious hatred that touches every multilingual and bilingual. So in language learning specifically, uh, inequities manifest themselves in whose multilingualism is accepted and praised, whose multilingualism is viewed as a problem often to be eradicated, and whose multilingualism remains invisible. And the world is also becoming increasingly more dangerous for multilinguals who are members of marginalized and minoritized communities. So for 50 plus years, my field, my dear field, which I am entirely committed to, um, but I am not above criticizing, um, has been pursuing one big question, really. How is second language acquisition different and more difficult than monolingual child acquisition? Second language adult acquisition, monolingual child acquisition. And I think it's about time that we start asking other big questions in the field. How can the research that we produce promote equitable multilingualism as a societal value for all, not just for some, as well as a window, uh, knowledge that gives us a window into understanding the human capacity for languages, which has always been a primary goal in the field, and I'm happy to maintain that goal, but how can we also negotiate having a goal where equitable multilingualism is understood better and supported better everywhere in the world. So I feel like what we have right now in our hands with this very uncertain world that we live in is a new SLA of the 21st century which could be supporting equitable multilingualism or not. It depends on how many risks we take as a field and as a discipline or how safe we want to play, how, how much we want to continue to do the same kind of research that we know how to do very, very well. And so knowing that my field is mostly socio-cognitivist and post-positivist, functionalist, although we also have formalist SLA, quantitative, experimental. My question for myself and my colleagues in my field is what's viable in this discipline uh, and in this research community, knowing where the epistemologies and ontologies come from. So I think that there are some factors that are holding back the field in this, in this um, imagination of the field that I have, hopeful imagination that it would be a field producing knowledge to support equitable multilingualism. And I'm going to talk about four um, drawbacks, four uh, problems that are holding us back. One is going to have to do with uh, two elements of the disciplinary identity of second language acquisition. The, the issue of the, the language to the second language and the issue of the late timing. Both are central to the, to the identity of the field. Um, the essentialist ontology of language that the field has always been based on. Uh, a teleological view of development, call it native speakerism. Some of the students um, this morning or this afternoon, we talked a lot about native speakerism and nativeness and non-nativeness. And the, the fourth one is um, the view that values are non-scientific. I think it's prevalent in the field of SLA and it's a big roadblock to anything like producing research for equity. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the disciplinary identity around language two and late timing and why this disciplinary identity has become a problem. The two elements are really cornerstones, but they are framed in ways that are not helpful. So the focus on the L2 has become a focus on one language only, one language at a time, no mixing ever no multiple uh, repertoire, right? So it's just this focus on a mono language, the target language, right? in isolation from all the other languages or the rest of the linguistic repertoire of the bilingual multilingual. 
possible in the making. And the late timing is always framed negatively as a disadvantage, as a problem, as a, oh, I wish I was a child when I started this language. So I think we cannot longer afford those framings of these two identity staples. Um, this is a famous book in the, in the 80s that defined the field and continues to, to be a, a metaphor, the language too. That's what we want to understand, that's what we want to study. And SLURF, Second Language Research Forum, is the main uh, conference of the field. Um, so as a result, the studies that we produce in SLA tend to be of the target language, of the second language, of the new language only, right? So we sample natives and non-natives. We uh, elicit only uh, data in the target language. The analysis are done by whom? By lingual transcribers, by lingual coders, by lingual readers? No, we say monolingual native speakers. They are the ones who can transcribe code and rate. And the constructs and the interpretations are designed to explain learning how to behave monolingually in a new language. That's really what we're trying to explain. What is the process? What are the factors that enable someone to eventually behave monolingually in a new language? And so this renders the multilingualism of the participants and the multilingualism of the phenomena of interest invisible, and this is really a problem. Take, for example, the heritage language literature, which is really burgeoning in the field of SLA, and the one-point generation literature, which is burgeoning in educational research and applied linguistics. They're the same people. They are the same people, but one group of researchers and one line of research does the study of their home language, the fate of the home language, and the other group, the societal language, the fate of the societal language. They never read each other, they never communicate, and they may be doing the same participants, literally. And what kind of portrayal do they produce? Well, the heritage language uh, Researchers are saying that oh, these heritage speakers, they don't really cut it ever as real natives, real monolingual like, in their minority language. The other group also is saying their English is always uh, noticeably less than different from, right? So again, they don't cut it also. And in the end, they are bilinguals with two languages that are totally separated and studied in isolation from each other. And the findings are never beneficial to the other uh, research community because they don't read each other. One language at a time, the target language only, the language of interest to the study. Um, I see things all the time like this. Adults are notoriously poor second language learners. This is the opening sentence in, a, in an abstract. I never cite where, how, who, but it's always very well-known authors in very top journals. I never go for obscure anything. Once you notice that this is not acceptable, you can never undo it. But many SLA researchers don't notice that this is wrong. So we have created a mirage of L2 acquisition as monolingual-like and impossible. And that is really a problem. The second problem is the essentialist ontology of language that the field is based on. Um, especially until the 90s, um, the, the theories of language that have fed into studies of SLA have been very, very essentialist. Language is seen as an objective reality and separate from communication and residing in the mind. That was the Chomskyan, explicitly Chomskyan view of language. There is also the view that language is a system made up of subsystems, sounds, words, sentences, and that it can be captured in grammar books, dictionaries, and corpora. And this is the Saucerian, Thucydian, Structuralist view. Both of them have inspired a lot of SLA research. And the disciplinary goal is to understand language development, and we behave as if we all knew what language is, and it's just the knowledge and the ability to use it. That's really how uh, language is defined in SLA. 
I mean, a lot of applied linguistics too, and language teaching too. But this is not the only choice. We have also non-essentialist ontologies of language theories, linguistic theories, that are non-essentialist. They understand language as a gerund, as a doing something. So instead of language, we could say languaging. Yeah? Instead of knowing language, having language, acquiring language, is languaging. And so in this other view, language constructs meaning iteratively out of recurrent social activities, yet often incompletely, unpredictably, and on the fly. It's a process, it's never a thing. Language has a reality only as a process of communicating, and language is located in social activity, which is distributed among social actors. So this means that we heterogenize and diversify language tremendously, that we focus on semiotic repertoires, not on systems of sounds or words or sentences, and that there are no owners of language. No natives who own, and no natives who uh, borrow. Um, we have some SLA theories that have been non-essentialist, and this is a blessing and an opening in the field. So we have the usage-based SLA family. The, those theories of linguistics on which they are based, usage-based linguistics, view grammar not as an out there system, but as something that is inseparable from the users and the usage events. We have by now a large number of very well-known, very prolific authors in SLA publishing under different versions of usage-based linguistics for the acquisition of a second language. We have the conversation analysis people, conversation analysis for SLA, they are also non-essentialist. And we have Vygotskyan SLA also working on a socially distributed cognition and language as a social practice. But business as usual is what we find in most SLA studies. There's really a faith the best grammars, the best dictionaries, and the most dense and well-designed uh, corpora will just give us the language, the English language, the Spanish language, the Arabic language. There's a faith in that. Yeah? And constantly, the metaphors are about knowing, having, acquiring, um, and then using what we know, processing what we have acquired. Yeah? But there is, it's always essentialistic. And again, I don't think we can longer afford to view language in this way and to study language uh, development in that way. When we view language as a system, we privilege the imagined varieties of the elites, idealized, homogenized, standard, educated, academic, literate varieties. They don't exist anywhere, but they are structures that are very powerful. We also privilege narrow views of what it means to know a language or to have communicative competence. And we are complicit with standard language purist ideologies as researchers. And very, very bad, we instill language insecurity or linguistic insecurity in our participants, in our students, in our colleagues, and very importantly, in ourselves. So here is uh, Grosjean, a very famous bilingualism researcher, how he describes linguistic insecurity. He says, many bilinguals have a tendency to evaluate their language competencies as inadequate. Some criticize their mastery of language skills. Others strive their hardest to reach monolingual norms. Others still hide their knowledge of their weaker language and most simply do not perceive themselves as being bilingual, even though they use two or more languages regularly. And I think a lot of people in this room probably have suffered from this on and off at some point for some language for some period of their life. So how and why does linguistic insecurity arise? I think it's from imagining language as a self-contained and self-explained system that can be reduced to the grammar book, the dictionary, and the large, well-designed corpus. Um, language is 
whatever the educated white middle class uh, uh, people speak or listen to or read. And language is something that has a perfect correspondence between language and meaning. Right? And it's always one language at a time, no mixing. All these things together are very essentialist. They really are the reasons why we uh, suffer from linguistic insecurity as bilinguals and multilinguals. So it, this, this language essentialism is ill-suited to address the competencies of multilinguals. Because there is constant learning and learning, relearning and non-learning of language over lifelong and life-wide experiences and for many multilinguals, typically in the face of oppression. So the process is absolutely messy. The outcomes are absolutely messy. Nothing like the abstractions of the idealized, standard, educated, elite, literate variety. All right, the teleological view of development is related to this, is the third problem. It's a vexing problem. It's so difficult to get out of it, right? But it happens when we uh, understand linguistic development as a ladder, a ladder to heaven, <laughs> or a very, very bad cloudy state, the, not, the, the native speaker state. Right? A ladder to native likeness. Right? Learning is becoming better and better and better until you can reach heaven and native likeness. So we have on the one hand the element, the ideological element of early is always best. Another one is the single language is the natural state of, of the human language. One language is natural and normal. And we can just focus on that. And monolingual nativeness is always superior. And once you get that, the obsession and negative framing of the late timing, the isolation of the L2 only, and linguicism, because that's what it is. Ageism, racism, ageism, sexism, linguicism, right? The mono, monolingual native speaker is always going to be superior. When we have these ingredients, the, the world of language learning is doing. Uh, of course, we have voices in SLA championing against it. Diane Larson Freeman has constantly written against it. And there is a beautiful article, and she gave this title to the article, There is no end and there is no state for language learning. And in a book as recently as 2017, she has a very long chapter doing like a full review and update of complexity theory in her view. And one of the principles, she, aphorisms that she offers is, learning is not climbing, uh, climbing a developmental ladder. It is not unidirectional. It is non-linear. And language and its learning have no end points. Both are unbounded. Language and its learning. And this is for everyone, not just for and not learning a new language, but for everyone. But again, business goes on as usual. Language uh, learning means becoming more native-like. The best source to learn a language continues to be portrayed as native speakers are the best source. And the best comparison and men benchmark to understand development in studies is native speakers as baselines. <laughs> Again, I don't think we can, longer, we can afford it anymore. And this also is very important, I think. There has been so much expansion in what we study in development. So respond is, responding to communicative competence and Heim's theories, uh, responding to the need to look at semiotic resources beyond the sentence. We have looked at variables. We have looked at pragmatics in the second language. We have looked at the interactional architecture and how it works with second language. We have looked at gestures now for quite a few years. So it's a tremendous accomplishment and, and expansion of what, it, what language means, right? However, concepts too, right? 
However, there is no progress if all of it is to be possessed by the native speaker, by the originary speech community. So if native-like ultimate attainment means monolingual-like, and if I'm supposed to develop the gestures of the monolingual English speaker when I'm speaking in English, or else I'm a failed learner, we have defeated the purpose. We can study gestures slowly or pragmatics or whatever it is, but if we're just gonna say, well, did you, are you doing it now like a native speaker? And also, I mean, realize how absurd that idealization is because there is no single native speaker that does gesturing or pragmatics the same way as the next um, native speaker. But in any case, a lot of people take um, satisfaction at these developments of the expansion of what counts as language. But if the, if the native likeness remains the benchmark, I think we have made very little progress. And finally, the fourth problem, values are non-scientific in the eyes of most SLA researchers. And it's very, very difficult to even begin to dialogue on this one with my community. They really just don't want to talk about this. They're open to discuss the other three issues, but this one is very difficult to discuss. So we have three positivistic assumptions for the position that values are non-scientific. First, in this, in this view, we distinguish facts from values. We assume there is a dichotomy there. Theory, facts are based on theory and knowledge building and they are the goal of research. And values are practical applications a posteriori independent from theory. So the two are separate, they're dichotomous, and they are of a different nature, right? And this is what we then see in the discourse of basic versus applied science. Uh, basic linguistics, theoretical linguistics, applied linguistics, basic engineer, engineer or basic mathematics, and applied engineering, applied mathematics. And this comes from Weber and the technicism. Um, so it's a philosophical position that is very well described and understood, um, but is absolutely embedded in contemporary thinking. Um, in many scientific areas. Also, it is thought that facts are neutral, so knowledge can and must be neutral, objective. So both there is a possibility of objectivity and there is a, a demand, there is, it has to be objective or else we're failing, right? And so this is post-positive. It is possible and it's necessary and desirable to be objective. And finally, very interesting in this part, and less, less known, less theorized, values are irrational, meaning they are beyond rationalization, beyond discussion. Values are emotional, they cannot be scrutinized through reason. Right? They are a matter of personal choice and therefore they escape rational scrutiny. This is what uh, philosopher McIntyre calls emotivism. You're entitled to your opinion, to your values, I'll respect them, because these are mine. There is no possibility of rational discussion of it. It's beyond. Of course, that then is beyond science, it's outside of science, because in science, knowledge, we have to be able to discuss and rationalize everything. So is there any option epistemologically, ontologically, methodologically beyond technicism, positivism, and emotivism for the field of SLA? So far, I have not seen a hope for that. I approach it, it's an absolute no starter. So, but at the same time, many of my colleagues do tell me that we are greatly expanding and becoming better as a field. And it's true, we had the social turn in the 90s, so suddenly we have a, a real wonderful variety and diversity of theories. Many are cognitive, many are sociocultural. All of them count as SLA now. Um, in 2016, I was part of a paper that was published uh, Model Language Journal, the Douglas Fir Group, and Kimberly Bush was also part of it. 
And there we were really examining the field of second language acquisition in light of multi a multilingual world. And we said that language learning was learning to negotiate social and linguistic action in the face of minimal common ground at maximal semiotic demands. Social and linguistic action. So this recognizes that language is a practice rather than a system. It's less essentializing that than other ontologies of language. And in the face of minimal common ground, recognizes that there is an unpredictability in communication always. And the semiotic de demands suggest and recognize that it's never just about language in the traditional sense of, of linguistics, linguistic science. Um, and we propose 10 fundamental themes in that article. So the first five suggest actually a non-essentialist position on language and competence. What is language? What is being good at language? Um, there was a sixth theme discussed that really explicitly make it uh, clear that second language acquisition researchers can have an educational calling that they are not, not about education. And the last uh, four themes really opened the door to subjectivity and values. So I, I'm very interested in those, and I don't know how they're gonna really seep into research in SLA in the future. But I honestly think that we have not come far enough, and the habitus, the research habitus, is not changing fast enough. And the world, on the other hand, is becoming worse and worse for multilinguals. Um, I think all multilinguals, all bilinguals, frequently experience oppression, all of them. Because it's a very normal experience to be positioned by others as a novice, a foreigner, an outside member, or a non-native speaker. We all, I'm sure we all have experienced this at some point. But there are other things that also happen. Bilinguals, multilinguals are racialized all the time. And they're being told that their language is not good enough, so learn more, spend more money on classes, <laughs> give more jobs to teachers. And this is the worst, probably. They are being promised that language will open all doors in life. If you only get good enough with your English, and your English is appropriate enough, educated enough, academic enough, your life will be better. But let's face it, in our present times, these isms are going to go away, just because we have better proficiency in whatever language we need to deploy. No. The, Isms are never going to go away because <coughs> just because our proficiency in the language is deemed to be better by some external gatekeeper. These other liabilities, which are different in different communities and different societies, but they're never going to go away. They are all intersecting with language, and language proficiency is not going to save us from it. They experience oppression. Do they feel that they have a right to speak, as Bonnie Norton called it? Do they feel that they have the power to impose meanings, as we all called it? This is really what it means to be successful and proficient in whatever language and communication we have to do. Right? If we feel like we have the right to speak, and if we feel like we have the power to impose meanings, we have succeeded. So, SLA researchers with their research and their knowledge should be able to help achieve this. And my question for my colleagues is, how able, how willing is the field to try to work towards this? Let me finish with some strategies, but I'm going to check how am I doing with time? 6.06. 6.06. When do you want me to stop? <laughs> Just give me, give me a time and I will. 
think I don't know, so it's 45 minutes, or, or you can take as long as you want. No, 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 no. Never, never good. Never good. Okay, questions. Yeah. I'll, I'll choose some things and skip other things. Okay. Because this, these strategies are really, I mean, I think, I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Mostly, right? I'm pretty sure. So these strategies that I keep developing and proposing and communicating um, in, in, in uh, presentations and publications, they're mostly for my colleagues. They're mostly for the people who are doing this work because it's in small steps and in little changes that may have ripple effects that the, the transformation in the research is going to happen. So on the one hand, the big ideas need to hit, but on the other, the small research strategies need to be there for people feel like they have some options to try out. So these are much more for anyone. If anyone in the audience does second language acquisition research of the more traditional kind, these are strategies for you. And I'll speak some. First, no subordinating comparisons, please. Do not compare natives to non-natives with the idea that you are subordinating one term of the comparison to the other. Right? So many colleagues ask me, well, if we can't compare to a monolingual uh, first language baseline, who do we compare our L2 learners and our bilinguals to? Um, well, some people have begun to say, well, maybe we should compare them with bilinguals from birth who grew up to be balanced bilinguals. There are all kinds of problems with that, but hey, if they want to try that, it's much better than saying, oh, there are no comparisons possible, we're not going to explore, we're going to go back to the L1 baseline. So I'm very happy for empirical efforts as seen whether this works or not. Other people have proposed, maybe we just need to compare them to extremely advanced or near-native late bilinguals. I would say advanced, yes, near-native doesn't exist. It's, it's a mirage, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the wrong kind of metaphor. But again, if you want to try that, please do empirical studies to do that, because we will learn a lot from them. The problem is when, when the response of researchers is, oh, we can't do anything because we don't have anything better than baseline L1 comparisons. Then we're stuck. And very nicely um, usage based, well, how about choosing mature, experienced users and not even calling them native or non-native? Right? Um, there's one study, and I was very happy when I saw it, SLA study, on accentedness. So they were studying 56 uh, Japanese freshmen without immersive experiences at all. So they were in Japan, they were doing EFL, they were freshmen, and the researchers wanted to know, okay, in terms of accentedness and, and intelligibility and pronunciation, how do we characterize them, right? So they decided to compare them to 10 late experienced Japanese English users at the point of ultimate attainment, that's what they say. They had arrived in Vancouver after age 18. They had been those freshman uh, participants, but now they were in Vancouver. They had arrived after age 18. They had resided in Vancouver for at least 10 years or more, and they reported frequent use of English at work or at home, very frequent use. So they were like, you know, these freshmen, if they have plenty of opportunities to learn and develop and keep using English, this is the trajectory that we should see. So they are the baseline. Even though that's a great thing to do. This is a proposal that uh, is now in writing, so I hope that some SLA researchers start getting interested in it because it's statistics. <laughs> and you know, this is the way to go. People like statistics, let's talk about statistics and how they can help us subvert the native speaker native speakerism problem. So, a priori native non native dichotomization of participants, we can actually just not do it and use statistics that allow us to um, skip it. So, in fact, what we know from research is that both monolingualism and bilingualism are on a gradient. Not, no one is really monolingual or really bilingual, right? And the pure monolinguals or the true bilinguals are just very, very, very weak. So the proposal from SLA researchers is that we should just be classifying everyone on a continuum, functionally monolingual, functionally bilingual. So that's a great proposal, empirical, it can be tested, but we can go to the statistics and we can use bottom-up statistics. 
where we don't need to first classify participants into native, non-native, first, second, foreign heritage. But we can just say, okay, all my participants here, all my tests, my measures, my analysis here, and then let me put them all into the statistics, and the statistics bottom up will tell me if they group, and the natives and non-natives shall never meet in the same group, the same profile, or whether the profiles sometimes are completely mixed, and there is no issue, and there is no material importance to being or not being of a native or non-native background. So cluster analysis and latent class analysis are two types of statistics which can be classed. There are some more ambitious strategies. Um, reframing, timing, positively late timing. How about getting used to saying, later is better, instead of earlier is better. The, la the later is better argument has so much research behind it, but the research is sort of ignored or not read in that, in that kind of light. Right? So we always say in SLA, this is a, su a summary of a finding that has become a generalization. Later is better initially, and then worse in the long run. So everyone admits that there is an acceleration of learning when you start later, but then eventually the children become better. But this acceleration also happens in early timed acquisition with children, with very, very young children. Bilingual children, it's better. In the beginning, for the initial period of development, it's better if they start at age four or three or seven as opposed to zero or one or three. Okay? There is an acceleration, a compression. And international adoptees, if they're adopted when they're a little bit older and their L1 is more developed, they initially make a lot more progress in the majority language, the new majority language, faster. So later is better for them. Initially, at least, their acceleration factor. And American Sign Language studies. So this has become this kind of like, there is a great advantage. If you're older, you're going to go faster initially. Yeah? And this is something that perhaps will evaporate in an immersive context, like a second language setting, an immigration setting, if you have enough exposure. And it won't evaporate at all in foreign language context, actually. So let's talk about later as an accelerating boost. Yeah? There is mature, higher order social cognition. It confers advantages and opportunities. All these things make us into better language communicators and better language learners because we're older. Um, yeah, I won't go into this, but this is like the discourse on, the, on that side. Explanations like, you know, with age, why can't we do it at an older age? because there is an atrophy of the hearing capacity for new language learning. We could just be saying adult neural and psych uh, physiological maturity helps, right? Instead of a roadblock to L2 learning, the linguistic <coughs> maturity already achieved uh, in the acquired language helps with the new language. Yeah? And instead of saying that adults over rely on explicit cognition and that's inefficient for the task of language learning. Well, let's call it cognitive maturity. And instead of thinking that the affective, emotional, and attitudinal forces negatively impact on adults' willingness or ability to learn from the input and from others, we can say, hey, they have social maturity. They know how to choose and pick who they want to talk to and who they want to learn from and how and what they want to learn. Uh, I'm just going to cut here. Yes. I'll, I'll finish with this because I'll tell you what I, what I get um, a lot from, from colleagues when I present these two SLA researchers. They say, yes, 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 all you're saying is good, you know, the oppression, the ideology, the emotions, the language that is non-essentialist, all of these things are really great, but does it have anything to do with actual linguistic development and attainment? Because we are, we just want to understand the development of the linguistic part of things. The world is much bigger, we know. Other people study these other things. We just want to understand linguistic development. 
And so, oops, that's going back. I want to answer that yes, all these contextual things and all these factors um, really are shaping language learning and the outcomes and the success. So I'll finish with this example. It's from one of my graduate students, and she's a teacher of Mandarin, and she shared it with permission. She wrote, in China, my students say, during study abroad, they received two completely different uh, reactions based on the foreign physical appearance. If they look really foreign, by which she means white, the locals are shocked that they can speak fluent Chinese. If they are Asian Americans, the locals think their Chinese is bad. So the Asian American students have to explain to the locals that their families are from China, Korea, or Japan, but that they grew up in the United States. Then she continues. The foreign-looking students take advantage of their Lao Wai identity. It means foreigner in China, in Chinese, it's not a bad word. And are able to interact with different uh, kinds of Chinese people. And they master a lot of street colloquial Chinese. They're adored for speaking some Chinese. Everyone interacts with them. They learn a lot of on the street colloquial Chinese. The Asian-looking students learn very polite forms of apology and barking words. Because they always have to apologize for not <laughs> speaking Chinese well enough. And because when they go shopping, people usually give better offers to the Asian-looking students. So the bargaining is, is learned well. So these people are receiving different receptions, but they're also learning different things because of the usage in which they are involved. And my, my student ends. As a teacher, I've always wanted to know, how would my students' social culture and self-identity and self-presentation in China shape their Mandarin Chinese outcomes? It's very interesting to look at the outcomes in this land. So I think it's not just for a teacher, but it should be for researchers. They need to consider these things when they look at the outcomes. All right, I'm going to skip a lot of other, you can, you can read the PowerPoint, it will be very nice. But I'm going to conclude. Okay, my conclusion. Yes. <laughs> so I've talked about the four constraints that I think are really stopping the field from, from making progress towards better goals and better research. And here is what 17-year-old Mexican-American Carmen says about liking being bilingual in the United States. So this is like a harmonious bilingual, an empowered bilingual, not a linguistic insecurity or a linguistically insecure bilingual. She says, but like my Spanish is getting a little bit bad, but I still try to have it. I still speak Spanish. Sometimes I speak Spanish. It's just like when I don't know a Spanish word, I'll say it in English, and if I don't know it in English, I'll say it in Spanish. It's just like, it's like an everyday thing. I think it's it's something that I am going to use like every day. Yeah, I use it, I translate for my mom and my grandma, and just here in school too. I like being bilingual. Very sort of like not the essentializing view of language and communication that SLA researchers would apply. Idea, Carmen's idea of bilingualism is very, very different from research-based constructions of success. So bilingualism is great in fuzzy probabilistic. It comes in many shapes and grades. And we're only studying a tiny, tiny slice right now. Um, the competencies and the practices are irreducible to dichotomies. And the entire range of bilingualism and language learning that we capture is totally inequitable, but it's invisible that it's inequitable in the studies. So instead of asking how else to acquisition is different and more difficult than monolingual child acquisition, let's try to look at better questions to ask in the future. And I'm happy with the social term. I'm invested in the multilingual term, but I think now we also need a social term, social justice term. 
um, so that we can really respond to the times that we have in our hands and support equitable policies. Thank you. We talked a lot about the social justice and such. Um, I was wondering, do you know if there's any serious research being done on adults with disabilities in bilingualism? There's a little bit of research, very little. The mm -hmm. technology and language learning people have begun to do okay. some research. So in Brazil, they're studying um, Brazilian, t uh, Brazilian students of English who have, I think they are with um, uh, physical disabilities, okay. and they want to study what they do about it and how they can have access to English, which is a good in society that everyone wants. Okay. There is also some research on autism and bilingualism, mm -hmm. uh, immigrant families uh, with with uh, things that are classified as disabilities in our laws, like deafness or hard of hearing. Um, so all those research uh, studies exist. They don't add up to humongous amounts of research, but they are very valuable studies. They're never done by second language acquisition researchers and seldom by applied linguistics researchers. Not yet. Yeah, is there, is there a, a reason why? Do you think? Like, a, is it part of the churn, do you think, that will come with social justice? Like I think with social justice, we should be looking at you know, the hidden places where people learn language. Yeah. Uh, because if our goal is to understand, uh, the goal of the SLA researchers is to understand the human mind and how language is part of the human experience or the human cognition, if you want to call it. Um, if that's the goal, we cannot, with a slice of research done on white middle class college students or international students who are at the top of the cream of their countries and have access to English and study degrees in English, right? If we only produce research about language learning from those uh, types of contexts, we are producing a tiny slice, and then we're saying, oh, that's the human mind. Mm -hmm. So the research cannot really be, and we've, my thing is also, we've done it, we've done it, we've exhausted everything we could do, I think, mm -hmm. um, in that direction. So it's time to look at other speak a lot of languages and they have and we should appreciate it for example one of uh, students that I work with he's from Congo he speaks nine languages mm -hmm. but he uh, at school he was um, placed in another setting just because he is not that proficient in English so do you think SLA will look at such population of people that they can see monolingualism and multilingualism in this term without literacy for example right so there is a whole area of SLA looking into that now. They are called LESLA. The acronym is L-E-S-L-L-A. So they have an association, a conference. They've been in existence for about either 10 or 15 years already. Um, yeah, but that's why I was asking, because there is a LESLA, and Bigelow and yeah. Borelli, they work with this population. But yeah. at the same time, I feel like uh, well, it was like uh, and LESLA. Like so it's interesting, Les Lassa community is a mixture of educational researchers, applied linguists, and SLA researchers. All of them are committed at the level of practice. So the social justice is perfectly acceptable as a citizenship private choice for all SLA researchers. So many of them are great volunteers and activists in the rest of their life, but not with their research 
in their research, they feel they have to exclude these things, right? Mm -hmm. So the LESLA community, there are some SLA researchers who are very active in it, and they are actually trying to introduce that population for research in the tradition of SLA. Yeah, that's what I mean. However, um, it cannot go very far if, for example, you study the um, adults with nine languages and no literacy, all the languages are oral, right? If you study them for their lack of literacy and with data from the one language that they don't know yet, mm -hmm. right? So the, the multilingual view of, okay, this person, their repertoire, and literacy is not a panacea. Literacy is not a, a neutral good that we all should adore or pursue. Literacy can be very oppressive. Literacy can be something that communities can reject. And so how do we study all these things in a way that we're, we're actually studying their development and their communicative um, uh, functioning in the new society where they're having to defend for themselves, but without introducing all these deleterious constructs and assumptions. So they're doing it, and, and I see this a lot, a lot of discussion. Okay, let's expand the populations that we study. But it's like, let's expand the populations that we study. So we're here, we have our studies, we have our methods, we have our constructs, we have everything all set up, all shaped by college, middle class, educated students. And now let's, let's look for other populations. Bring them to us, right? And that's, I don't think that's gonna work. It's like, Let's look for other populations. And you just have to go all the extra mile to rethink your research. And it still has to be about linguistic development, fine. But it can't just be what you knew how to do and now just apply it to or bring the others to apply it. So it's not working entirely in my view. But, but those are very generous SLA researchers, so I shouldn't be totally criticizing them because they're devoted what they believe is a uh, very social justice cause. Um, <clears throat> I would like to bring uh, three concepts that you mentioned in your uh, presentation, and one has to do with racialization, the other one with social justice and whiteness. Mm -hmm. When we see, for example, that, and let's talk about higher education and how, for example, English learners sometimes are, re are reclassified as ESL, whatever, and then they have to basically start the process again. And we used to talk about native speakerism and like this idea that the ideal teacher is the native speaker. And then we see that there's a lot of ideological learning, things that are actually take, taken for granted in composition departments, in ESL departments, and ESL and the SLA field. I mean, you can see like you know, who are in charge of this uh, discipline. So I always see like there's a problem with stance making. How can we start doing like enacting change from the bottom so we can start like having this conversation in composition programs, for example, or ESL composition that are clearly divided by the fact that college composition is just for native speakers and ESL is for the rest. So there's a lot of like political aspects and issues going on and you mentioned that sometimes they just play them right there because they have to pay money and they have the actual they have the money makers in universities. So how can we actually start making progress as teachers, for example, and start making these things more salient, more visual, more visible, that's the thing, for people who think that they own English as a language, and therefore they are entitled to just classify people however they want. Yeah. So I think I was talking a little bit to the students about this. I feel like there are always two levels at which we have to, to uh, act, right? And one is a very grounded local level, and it's on the fly. And so I feel like many teachers already do many things in classrooms where they are actually not essentializing language, where they're not uh, racializing their students. Moments, perhaps, not the entire, you know, curricula and textbooks and um, the trained education that we get to be teachers really is heavy on us. But on the fly, there are many instances in, in teaching where all those things are just not there and some, some real uh, human 
contact and learning habits and a subversion of all these things. So at that level on the ground, we don't have many studies documenting that, documenting when it arises and how, trying to, to show examples to other teachers, to other educators. So that ground level, I think, needs to be both in the research and in our own practices. And then the other would be the very top level. So training in policy, in ideology, in uh, deconstructing our epistemologies of the West, right? or of the, of the global North. So the more our curricula are critical, and I think in this department, actually, you have a lot of that, right? The more we can educate um, teachers. However, with composition studies, I mean, everything is always so paradoxical, right? So composition studies have been in postmodernism and post-structuralism for a long time. But they've been so white in that. It's been so global north how those uh, views of post-structuralism and postmodernism have uh, developed and evolved that they haven't confronted other things like colonialism, orientalism, and whiteness, and white supremacy. So it's constantly identifying, you know, why am I falling for this trap right now, and how am I not doing something about it at the, ideolo the ideological level, or the level of knowledge, and at the level of on the flight practice. I don't think we can do anything, like transform anything, if we're not constantly trying to address Levels. Just big ideas don't work, um, but only grounding, grounding, grounding on the fly also doesn't work. Um, so one of your points was um, that values are considered non-scientific, and um, researchers really don't want to talk about them. Um, ideally, what would you, what directions would you like that? discussion to go, if, if, theoretically, if it could happen? Like, what would you consider most important based on this social justice? Uh, oh, if anyone, or, yeah. If any of my colleagues sat at the table with me to say, okay, so really, it's not unrigorous to think like, because my pitch is like, can we have explicit social justice uh, goals in our research. Can we design the studies so that they are serving uh, uh, social justice goals? And then they feel like, no, because that would constrain us and, and we would be uh, designing studies for the wrong reasons. We would be biasing our hypothesis and questions and stuff like that. So they, they completely, just completely, completely close off on that one. There's just never a dialogue, never. Um, and then they will t they will start telling me like you know but I'm, I'm an absolute you know advocate of this and I do these things in my private life and I've always been of this political persuasion and I yeah. so they they are happy separating divorcing the two the production of knowledge from the you know the activism the social justice orientation that many intellectuals and many academics have it's not all so what would I want? Just, and I haven't discovered yet how to do that. You know, The statistics thing, like let's do bottom up statistic and see what happened. Already some people are like, ooh, yeah, let's try that. So I, I come up with suggestions all the time. <laughs> Thinking, you know, trying to think like them because I know how they think. And I also think that my colleagues allow me to talk like this to them because they know that I paid my dues for a long time. So they cannot totally discount me like, oh, she just doesn't do our research or doesn't know what our research is about or she doesn't know how to do our research, would never know how to do it. So there is a certain value to whose voice uh, is speaking to whom. But on that point, I have not been able yet to see any opening or get any reaction. And people get upset. They get So before coming to the United States, I didn't really know that those children who are coming to the schools, they are certainly labeled, those children who are coming from specific countries or specific specific proficiency labeled, like ESL, ELL, or EL, EALL. So, um, but since my children started their schooling in Minnesota, they were called ESL, 
in Shipa Elu and in, in uh, Massachusetts, they are called ELLs. So uh, my question is, what is the position of SLA in creating these terms? And do they really like it? Do they want to create more terms when they will start involving bilinguals and multilinguals? Because for them, it's not second language anymore. For them, it might be third or fourth or etc. So the, the use of labels and the definition of labels is a, a continuous problem anywhere, right? In terms of language is our straitjacket and our tool for power both, right? Um, so we invent labels that for a while actually serve us well and maybe uh, sort of like transformative or emancipatory and then they turn on us and they, they begin to be deficit, entirely deficit oriented. When we catch that, we should you know, drop the labels. <laughs> if they stop serving us, we should drop them. But that's one thing. And the other one is the, the practice of labeling, labeling people. So it doesn't matter what label you attach. If it's the system or a school system labeling and classifying and then tracking, etc., providing different kinds of quality of education and access to education differentiated by the labels, then that's a huge problem. Um, I don't think that SLA researchers necessarily do that. It's the education apparatus that is doing that. Education and literacy are not neutral, not to be always revered, an instrument, a human instrument like any other. So complicit in a lot of things, it can be used for good and for bad, and other times it can be used for bad. So the SLA researchers, the labeling that they're happy with is native, non native, for example. We absolutely believe that they are referential labels that actually define people. Um, ELLs, for example, is not a label that you will see very much in uh, SLA papers. Uh, Guadalupe Valdez and Amanda Kibler have a very nice uh, paper on labeling of children uh, in schools. I should say labeling is a human act, and it's, just, it's not just in the United States. It's in every school system and society. There are a lot of problems there. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, in your paper, you also mentioned this heaven or this Spanish line that is like looking or being like a native speaker in your second language. Having that in mind, and if we look at these standardized testing for English, Cambridge, IELTS, and TOEFL, where there is a number that will classify you that you are there in the finish line, what should be our position, critical position, in terms of those standardized tests? Are they fair? Are they attainable? Are they? They are. <laughs> <laughs> they are there, and they're not going to go away, right? I have to say the language assessment field has also a critical side to it. So there are some researchers in assessment examining the social justice issues um, with uh, assessment. They're in a bad position to do that because they really love assessment but also <laughs> see the problems with it. Uh, but teachers are in a bad position because we cannot decide whether assessments are going to exist in a society and whether our students are their parents and their bosses and whoever is going to buy, uh, to buy into tests or not. So I think the students and education are served if teachers teach things for the purpose of do, doing better in the test while never um, forgetting to mention the critical questions about the test. Who created this test? What uh, purposes it serves and whose interests is this test serving. Right? So we can we can teach a TOEFL class and we can tell people how to get the highest score on the TOEFL class, but if we think we're doing them a favor with that and then we never discuss TOEFL and its place in society, but it's not just TOEFL, it's English, place in society of English, right? If we don't include that in our TOEFL cor course, we're failing our students. So it's like this promise that, oh, just become more proficient or get a better score, and all doors will open in your life. Right? 
if we are teaching, even implicitly, giving that message, it's a disservice to our students, because that's not reality. But, I mean, are you going to fight the tests? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think Julie was first on sure. the yoga. Sure. So. Um, in your call for a social justice turn, is there a particular definition, working definition that you have in your vision, or are there any particular pitfalls you think that the field should avoid? For what? In defining social justice. Defining. Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, <coughs> I have been looking for definitions of social justice, and different fields have different definitions. All of them are pretty neoliberal, and so that's a problem. <coughs> Many are very democratic, and that's a problem. Um, and so I am very happy that I am in a three-year grant with uh, four universities in South Africa, and my way, the Multilink Center for Multilingualism at the University of Oslo. So we have a three-year grant, and this is the first year I already went once to South Africa. I'm going in December. I'm hosting a workshop, a three-day workshop, uh, in three weeks at Georgetown. And so it's going to be 40 of us from the six universities, and we're going to discuss exactly that. Global South, Global North, tensions and pitfalls. Out of that, how do we define social justice? And do we have some kind of a shared definition? Or is that even possible? Do you want to see what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, it would be a good start for SLA if every study and every piece in SLA would make an explicit recognition that multilingualism is inequitable, that for some people it's a gift and they're praised for it and they're encouraged and support to continue with the language learning. And for other people it's a curse and they are uh, stigmatized for it or just that's an excuse. They're stigmatized for who they are eyes of others. But to acknowledge that in every study would be a very big beginning. And then they would say, you know, like, and, and today my study is about the, the elite multilinguals who have it really easy in life and they're supported and admired to keep learning language. That would be good. A good beginning. This partially answers the question that I feel is hanging, why SLA um, theorists are not really engaging in the kind of scholarship that would connect cognitive issues with larger issues. Yeah. And, um, so I was thinking that these four obstacles are really rooted in specific ideologies, for example, about what is native speakerism, about how um, research should be neutral. So they are very much rooted in, in, in specific ideologies that SLA theorists need to acknowledge mm -hmm. in order to be able, even um, when they tell you, for example, oh, I, I don't want to get into the social justice realm because um, then I wouldn't be doing research. But this is a, a value laden statement. It's a value laden choice that they're making. It's not that they are putting themselves outside that. So. Because I, I also keep thinking, how is this possible in SLA when in other uh, areas, like for example, I'm thinking critical discourse analysis, or people who are doing work uh, on language and capitalism, like uh, Christian is doing, uh, language and politics. I mean, there's so much radical work out there in linguistics. Mm -hmm. And for SLA to be still so resistant, despite also the literature that you presented yeah. and, and the work you yourself are doing, um, it's, it's, it's really puzzling. And then to take it a step further, and you addressed this in one of your very recent papers, and I appreciate it. It's like, so what is the role of us linguists, whether we do SLA or you know, in whatever realm of, uh, of linguistics we are, 
in this current day and age, uh, with the shift in politics, with the rise of populism and authoritarianism, uh, racism, how can we not invite these other issues into our research? Uh, yes, I mean I agree. All, all four problems are ideological problems. They are the ideologies of ages, um, the ideologies of um, mono, monoglossic ideologies that isolate one language at a time, one language only. Um, all of them, all four, are, are exactly uh, rooted in ideologies. But they are ideologies that need to be understood within the discipline of second language acquisition. So they are, you know, they resonate with other ideologies that we've seen described and studied in other communities. Um, but they do take this, like the disciplinary identity. What are we studying? It's late timed learning, right? Otherwise, it's just uh, child bilingualism. That's not what we're studying. Or, well, but we're interested in the new language. How does the new language, how is it constructed, right? So, so a lot of those ideologies are, are individualized, if you want, for the specific uh, discipline and community. And, but that's, it's, it's the, what is it called, the chicken or the egg, right? It's like, uh, can, you, can you not see that these are ideologies? Well, no, ideologies are outside. Uh, I would never be ideological. I am a subjective researcher, right? So, so, and that's the, the you know, that's the breaking point for me. That's where I, I'm like, I don't know how else to make them connect. But I will say that I don't think, I don't want to, um, to say, well, do critical discourse analysis, do ethnography, do, you know, critical sociology, change fields and do something else. It's not that. I'm saying study your language development that you want to study, but study it better. And when you bring in all these ideologies that we know, not in SLA, but in language learning, are totally shaping what's happening with language learners. Uh, when, we, when we know about power and identity and agency and ideology being absolutely shaping language learning, read the other disciplines, read the critical discourse analysts, read the other people, learn from that, and then with that knowledge, do your research. Right? So it's not like uh, abandon that field, <laughs> go somewhere else, do it differently. It's like rethink your field, do it, but do it better. are apolitical, so that's not where I, I am. So, I mean, um, it's not only SLA, it's also language teaching can be completely a social justice oriented, right? So again, if we think we're teaching communicative competence. So, I mean, if we, th if we think we're teaching language, and then discussion is how to teach it better, the classical method or the communicative competence method. We're still not discussing what shapes language learning, what is language, what are these students doing in my class and not doing something else in some other space and time, right? So, I don't, yeah, I used to study the effectiveness of instruction, and I used to think it's very important to know how to teach this better this way or that way. I, I still think, you know, I, I could probably in the classroom, I probably have very good instincts and I can teach better whatever it is that they need to answer in the exam this way or that way. And it's going to be different for different things in the exam. Not everything is best taught classically or in the communicative competence way. But in both cases, they are setting up a world where 
we are teachers, we teach language. If we do that, if we do it efficiently, that's our job done. Okay? And I think that the same criticism as with the salary can be labeled, be labeled to, uh, to <coughs> teaching in that way. Technocratic teaching. Okay. Thank you.